Next up, we have, um, it's a pleasure to welcome David Morrison. He's the senior scientist at the new Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute, or SERVI, uh, which is headquartered at NASA Ames. And uh, he is also a fellow of the California County of Sciences. Great pleasure to welcome David Morrison. Thank you. Well, this has been a fun afternoon, and I'm going to be talking about some of the same topics, but perhaps from a slightly different perspective. Let me ask the people there if I push a button, does this advance? No, but if I ask you to do it, it does advance. It. That's much better. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about whether we should get ready to and some others, focused on what was the biggest risk. And we figured that out because our friends who studied the, the atmosphere concluded that an object about one to two kilometers in diameter hitting would throw so much dust into the atmosphere, it would block sunlight for several years, lead to what we called an impact winter. And that would really play the devil with civilization not a mass extinction, not something that's going to kill directly a lot of people or animals or anything else, but would wreck agriculture. And we ask ourselves, if the earth lost an entire year of crops, what would the consequences be? And I'll ask you, how, how much food do you think the earth has in storage if suddenly there were no more harvests for a year? Any guesses? Not enough, maybe two months, maybe three months. If you're in the tropics where you're used to having uh, harvests every three times a year, you'd really be badly off. And we called that a civilization threatening impact and we focused on the necessity we felt to avoid that. That was the worst thing we could imagine happening short of a mass extinction. And so we said, let's go out and try to find essentially all of the asteroids larger than one or two kilometers in diameter in Earth-crossing orbits and find out if any of them really was on a collision course. The Congress supported this and uh, in a series of, of bills passed said that NASA should study and ultimately do a survey focused on finding the objects bigger than one or two kilometers or about a mile in diameter. Next, um, we made a plot that suggested how many asteroids there were of each size. Well, this is not numbers of asteroids it's against size. This is the frequency in which they hit the Earth against their energy in megatons of TNT. And we ended up putting together data from astronomical telescopes, from craters on the moon, from craters on the Earth, and calculated this sort of global catastrophe probably would happen about once every, excuse me, would, would probably happen over there about once every million years. So this was kind of an easy thing to do. We weren't in any hurry, but we wanted to find them and see if any time in the next million years or next 10 years, we would be hit by such an object. The conclusion was what we called the Space Guard Survey. Space Guard Survey consisted of three or four modest-sized telescopes doing these nightly surveys that you've seen described. It was made possible not only by the telescopes, but by the detectors, by the computer capabilities, and it was very, very successful. The, when we started out, the number of asteroids known, near-Earth asteroids, was a couple of dozen. Now it's well over 12,000. And the really good news is not one of these 12,000 asteroids is on a collision course with Earth. In the case of the ones larger than a kilometer, we found 95% of those that are out there, not 100%. You can never get 100%, or at least you can never be sure you have. But we think we did a good job with this, and that we're OK. Now the question comes, what about all the others? As, as, uh, 
Ed and Rusty and several people have said, because now if we sit focus not to what is the biggest risk, the worst thing that can happen, what's the most likely thing to happen? And the most likely thing to be hit by is something reasonably small. Chelyabinsk was about the size of this room. You double that or triple that, and you're talking about something that could wipe out a city. So we are talking now about dealing with risks that are different from a global catastrophe. And that's what I want to talk about for a few minutes. How do we think about those risks? The next. Um, first of all, we ask if we did find something, could we defend against it? Because now we're thinking of more frequent events, I think you might really expect to find within your lifetime. And the answer, of course, as people have said here, is yes, you could use kinetic impacts, run into it with a rocket and change its orbit slightly. Maybe you could use nuclear explosives for the same thing. Or if you had a prediction, you can simply evacuate. <coughs> In that case, we're talking about a situation that we're really familiar with and that is hurricanes in this country at least. The warning you have on a hurricane is a few days, maybe a week, and cities can be evacuated in that length of time or the people that stay behind can take shelter. So either way, whether we decide we have to deflect it or we just want to take the hit, the important thing, the critical thing is to discover it in advance and predict what's going to happen. Now, it turns out it's a lot more complicated than that, if you've probably heard. There are the international aspects, there are the uncertainties, and so I want to just lead you through an exercise that was designed to illustrate just how difficult it is in practice, not technically, but in deal with uncertainty and with people. And this was an exercise that was done at an international planetary defense meeting in Rome uh, three months ago, and they postulated and did good, accurate, technical orbits. What if we discovered an asteroid with seven years warning and it looked like it might hit the Earth? This was a possible sequence of events. Everyone would be different. But there are lots of problems. When you start out, you may know its orbit moderately well. You don't know how big it is at all. This could have been a 100 meter or a 400 meter object, which is a huge difference in the consequences. Also, as Rusty explained, you can, even if you don't know whether it's going to hit or not, you can begin to look at the risk corridor, this projection of the asteroid's orbit onto the Earth to see where it might hit. Or put it another way, to see where you definitely know it won't hit. So let's look at that. This was the orbit that they picked. It's a perfectly realistic asteroid orbit. It goes out a long way and then comes back in. You'll see that uh, there are going to be times when it's behind the sun or times that it's not observable for other reasons. So now you have the practical astronomical problem. You've found it, but how much more data are you going to be able to get and when to figure out if it really is going to hit the Earth and if so, where? This was the risk corridor. These are a bunch of dots that are actually computer simulations of where the object would hit if it hit. We still don't know. Maybe it's 5% chance, 95% chance it will miss. And you can see that this exercise was interesting because it doesn't go across US or Europe or Russia or the big spacefaring nations. It goes right across the Pacific and, and Southeast Asia, close to China, across India, across Iran, uh, Vietnam, Laos, the Philippines, and you have to ask yourself, as soon as you see this, what are those countries going to do about it if they find themselves a target? There are only two spacefaring nations there, uh, China and, and uh, India, and it's not clear that either one of them by itself would be able to do a deflection. The question then, of course, is who would and who would they trust? If there were a risk of an asteroid hitting in China, do you think China would trust the U.S. to do a deflection mission? We have this U.N. set up that, that Rusty talked about that ultimately might resolve that. But in the real world, when you start looking at a specific scenario like this, it gets kind of interesting. 
Well, of course, this scenario was designed so that it would hit, and we found that out a couple of years before the impact. Only then did we really know that a 100% chance of hitting. And the next chart shows where it resolved. When you shrink down that risk corridor and adjust it, this is the area that was likely to be hit somewhere along this line across the South China Sea. How would the nations around there react? Well, for one thing, we really don't have a very good understanding of what a tsunami would do. It depends very critically on where the, where the object hit and how big it was. You see that there's very little land area uh, at risk. Uh, central Vietnam and a little bit of Cambodia. But you could perhaps produce a tsunami that would go everywhere around the South China Sea, including Hong Kong and, and other places in China. So now the countries in Asia begin to ask, what should we do about it? If you were going to deflect it, move it off the earth, it turns out that the dynamics are such you have to move it that way. China says this is unacceptable. That could be a tsunami that could damage our whole southern coast. India, sitting up that way, says no way, take the hit because uh, you're, you're trading a risk that's relatively small for the possibility of wiping out some of the most densely populated in the areas in the world, like the Ganges Plain. Now, we were just playing games with this. We didn't have real diplomats. They would have been much more diplomatic. We were a bunch of scientists doing this. But we had to think about what in the real world might happen. And again, would the US, Europe, Russia be interested in spending a billion dollars on a mission to try to deflect it, and would the local countries admit? Well, in our scenario, our make-believe scenario, and this is all make-believe, it was decided the U.S. would send kinetic energy missions to hit the asteroid and try to move it off the Earth. And only one of the five missions that were sent succeeded in hitting it, which meant the impact was not moved off the Earth, but moved up that way. Let's look at the last slide. That is where it was going to end up hitting. Uh, right across Bangladesh, and Dhaka is actually hidden under that. Dhaka is a city of 15 million people. That's a country, a city. And it's somewhat very densely populated, very poor. By this time, you've lost the opportunity to do another mission. You can only launch in discrete windows. And so we ended the exercise with imagining what would happen given two or three months' warning. And, of course, it doesn't mean you're going to kill all those people. It is possible to evacuate. And, uh, and that's probably what would happen. But now it's a civil defense problem instead of a problem for physicists and astronomers. Uh, yeah, that's where it finally would hit. Do I have another one there? Or is that the end? That's the end. Okay. So, this is one example of what I might call real-world problems. Diplomacy, uncertainties, and then when you talk about evaluating risk, there's one more thing I want to mention. Uh, risk can be evaluated by calculating how big a footprint of an explosion or a crater there would be, and, and if you put that on the Earth, how many people would it kill? And of course, it's very different. It was in Bangladesh from, from the middle of the Pacific Ocean. But there is another aspect of it that really is very difficult. What is the social, psychological impact of a truly catastrophic event like nothing we've seen before? Can you just do it by counting up casualties of people that might be killed? And I think probably not. It's very hard. I don't know how to calculate it. But we have examples. The uh, 3,000 people killed in the 9-11 attack on New York led to a worldwide depression. The uh, Fukushima earthquake, terrible earthquake and tidal wave, greatly amplified because Japan ended up closing all its nuclear power stations, took Japan into a depression, then Germany decided to close all its nuclear power stations. You have worldwide consequences of countries that were nowhere near where the tsunami was. We don't know how to evaluate that. 
and I ask social scientists when I come to them, yeah, we can calculate how big the risk is from a small impact or a medium impact, but do we have any idea what else could happen, what consequences if it landed on, suppose it turned out, it wouldn't be like this, suppose the target were Mecca or the Vatican or somewhere very special like that, what would we do? I don't think we know. It's, it's beyond what us mere astronomers can study, but we can ask the question. Thanks.